Nice, then let's switch to English again and go into our third lesson. If you can remember what we had before the break, we had a single chart and now we want to make our application a multi-chart application. So we need to build a reusable user interface component. And this is exactly what we are going to do. So this is also new content for you. Please follow along. Uh, you can right click on the machine monitor and go to add and then you will find something which is called user control. This is what we are going to use. There is also the concept of a custom control in, in WPF, but this would be way too complicated to build a custom control. A custom control would be a very generic control like a date picker or something like this. But typically in a relatively simple or medium complex WPF applications, you prefer user controls over custom controls. So go for user control. Let's call this one the temperature chart. Okay, that should be our user control, the temperature chart. Make sure that user control.pf is selected here. Go for it. If you check what is uh, what is happening here, you will see that we have a XAML just like in the main window, but the root here is user control instead of window. So if we check this one, the root is window and here the root is user control, but everything else is pretty similar. So if you also check the temperature chart XAML CS, we get a class, we have this initialized component, everything else is very, very similar. Just the base class differs a little bit. On the one hand side it's window and here it is user control. Now, how can we migrate our chart from the main window into the temperature chart? Very simple with copy and paste. So what we do is we go into the main window XAML and copy everything. No, not copy, really cut and paste everything except the root element. So window resources, items control, everything, cut it go into the temperature chart and here inside the temperature chart, paste it. Of course, this doesn't work because here we still have the word window. You see that one? And that's obviously not correct because I told you the root element is no longer window. The root element is user control. So let's change window to user control. So with that, we shouldn't have any red squigglies here anymore. And if I click on reload designer, we should get an empty designer. And if I compile everything, we shouldn't get any errors. Yeah, it compiles exactly as I expected it. If we run the application, it would be empty because now our main window is, as you can see here, empty. So how can we use the user control directly in the main window? That's pretty simple. Just use it as a tag. Just, with, just like with Angular components, where you extend HTML5, here we are extending XAML. So what we can do is we can say local temperature chart, and that should give us the temperature chart. So if I run this application now, hopefully we will see a chart just as we had it before. See that one? So what is the learning here? You can rip out some parts of your main window into user controls, put them into user controls and use the user control as shown here. It's as simple as that. Of course, if you use multiple instances of this user control, just as we will do in a second, it will not remain that simple. So wait for a second. We will have to adjust our coding a little bit but at the end of the day, it will be very, very similar to what we now have. This is user controls. Let me quickly remind you what we are, uh, what my goal is uh, for you. I showed it to you multiple times, but uh, it's always good to refresh our memory. See, here, this is what we want to have. So we want to have not a single chart, but we have multiple charts. So essentially what we are going to do is we are going to reuse our temperature chart 
multiple times we are going to use here temperature chart here temperature chart here temperature chart and I think you got the point right good so let's do that for that we have to change the code of our main window .saml.cs a little bit because from now on we do no longer want to have a single sensor but we want to have multiple sensors so let's change the C sharp code so we can uh, maintain a list of sensors okay let's do that let's define a constant with number number of sensors just to have a constant that we can easily change and play with very small number of sensors with a large number of sensors this is where we define how many sensors we would like to have next we will get rid of this single sensor here let's delete it and replace it with a property list of sense a uh, temperature sensor temperature sensor here and let's call it sensors okay and this one is a read-only list so let's do it like that now the next question is piece is is maybe somewhat complicated this one here has a list is list in this case correct or do I again have to use observable collection? What do you think? The correct answer would be it depends. If sensors are added at runtime while the application is running, maybe new machines are coming online and we add new sensors to our application, then we would have to use an observable collection. If the number of sensors is static, we create it in the main window and during the runtime of the application there are no sensors added or no sensors removed then list is perfectly fine because we are not interested in changes of the number of sensors because there are no changes happening do you see the thinking here so if the collection if the content of the collection is static we can use a regular collection like a list or array or something like this if the content changes here then we have to obviously here use an observable collection. I hope this is clear. Now this data structure is not, is not perfect yet because let me quickly run the application again. We do no longer just need sensors for getting the current value per machine, but we also need the history of the values per machine. So it's not enough to have a single observable collection with all the temperature readings, but we need temperature readings per sensor. So we need an observable collection here, we need the observable collection here, we need the observable collection here, and I think you get the point. So it would be a good idea to not just store a single temperature sensor here per list item, but to build a data structure where we group the sensor from which we read data and the history of the sensors in a single data structure and maintain a list of these data structures instead of just the sensors. So let's do that. Let's create exactly that. So let's maybe create up here a record. You already know what the record is. Record, record. And I will call this sensor with values and here we have let's add three properties string name just to have a name for the sensor it, they, they will just be called sensor one two three to ten or something like this just for printing a nice name on the screen then we have the temperature sensor this is now replacing this down here and then we need according to the sensor the collection the history of readings so we will maintain the observable collection inside this data structure temperatures oops temperatures this is what we call it understand what we do we now have a data structure consisting of the sensor from which we can read the current temperature we have the name of the sensor and we have the history 
of the temperatures inside of this data structure. And with that, we can turn our list into a list of sensor with values. And now we are prepared to build the business logic. We do no longer need that one because that is old. That was just a single sensor. Now we have multiple sensors. This one might be a little bit complicated for you to follow along, but I hope you understand what we are doing here. We are maintaining a list of this data structure and the history of the values is embedded within this list. So we have an observable collection inside the list of sensors. I will take a sip of water and give you the chance to ask any questions if you have some. Good. Nice. Okay, so let's rework our main window down below here. This one, this will be the important one. We now have not a single sensor, but we will need to create a lot of sensors. Let's do that. Let's create a for loop var i equals zero, i lower than number of sensors, i plus plus, and let's add a sensor with value sensors.add new we will add a sensor with value let's generate the name sensor i plus one so it, they are called sensor one sensor two sensor three that will be the name the second one will the sensor so let's create a new temperature sensor and the last one will be the empty observable collection for all the temperatures. So let's just create the empty collection. That is now creating a list or filling the list of sensors with 10, oops here, 10 sensors. This is just replacing the new statement. Before we had a single sensor. Now we have 10 sensors. Okay, nice. Down here, in the tick, we now have to do also a loop because here we need to iterate over all the sensors because we have to read not a single temperature, but 10 temperatures and we have to add the temperature to the collection. So with that, we can simply do a for each loop. For each var, let's call it, I don't know, um, S like sensor in sensors. And let's wrap that here into a for each loop. We go to the current sensor to read the temperature. We add it to the current sensor and we delete from the current sensors history. Oops, here, S dot. Hey, what are you doing? Come on. Now we are good. IntelliSense was too intelligent. Understand what we do? We have exactly the same logic as before, but now we are simply doing it for every of our 10 sensors. And that's it. We have changed our application so that we have no longer a single temperature sensor with a single history of temperatures, but we now have a list of sensors with a corresponding history of temperatures. We replace the single new statement with a for loop with new statements so that we can create all 10 sensors. And inside the timer, we are no longer just reading one temperature and adding it to one collection of histories, but we are doing it with a for each loop uh, over all sensors. Now, the last one is again something that we don't need to type in. The last one is again something that I will give you in the gist that I gave you at the beginning. Let me quickly show you the gist. This is the gist. Uh, it is the same URL that you got at the beginning of the lesson, but of course I will share uh, this gist again with you over GitHub, uh, oh, sorry, over Discord in a second. So this one. I don't need that one, don't need that one. And copy that one. 
I will go to Discord now and send you the gist. You will see in a second why I give you the entire code here. You can go to mainwindow.xaml and replace everything with the code that you find in this gist. The reason why we are not typing in this code is because there are no new elements in this code anymore. Of course, I will do a code walkthrough with you. The first part here are just stylings. I took the time yesterday to come up with meaningful values. So I decided about colors and distances and alignments and things like that. It's really just graphical styling. In practice, you would have to design the user interface. In this lecture, I decided to do it for you just to make sure that the, that the result of the lesson looks a little bit nicer. So this is just resources and styles nothing new here. The rest has some interesting aspects embedded in it, but essentially it's all the same. We, we did that over and over again, and I would like to show you what's going on behind the scenes. Let's focus first on the first element here, listbox. If you can remember how the user interface looks on the left hand side, we want to have a list box, a collection of all the different sensors. And this is exactly what I'm doing here now. Can you remember about the dock panel? I think it was in the first lesson of XAML when I told you about the dock panel where you can dock something on the top of the screen, the left edge of the screen, the bottom of the screen or the right edge of the screen. And I'm using here the dock panel to dock the list box on the left hand of the screen. Now the items source here is the list of our sensors. We have talked about item, sensor, uh, item source last lesson and this lesson again. Essentially, we are binding it to this list of sensors. See that here? This is what we are doing here. We want the user to be able to select multiple sensors. This is why we set the selection mode to multiple. And we want to display the name of the sensor here. So again, we use the display member path, which we have used multiple times throughout this course. And we also used it today. So this list box shouldn't be any problem for everybody to understand. If you have questions, don't hesitate. There is, that is, it's absolutely no problem if you still have some knowledge gaps to fill, ask questions if something isn't clear. Now down here, I'm again using an items control to display this time charts. You see it? Same concept as we had before. Let me show you what I mean. If I take the chart that we have built step by step together, this was our chart that we created today. Let me get rid of that one. And if you can remember what we did, we had an items control. We used a data template to turn double values into rectangles. And we used the stack panel orientation horizontal to build our chart. And now watch what we do now. Again, I do an items control, but this time I'm using the temperature charts. Well, with a short text block to display the description, the name and so on. And I have a nice little border around it, but that's not the point. We are using an items control to display the temperature chart again with the data template. And it, just like here on the left hand side, I'm using the items template, but this time use a wrap panel in order so that all the temperature charts flow depending on the size of the window. But the structure is exactly the same. The concept is always the same. You use an items control or a data grid or a list uh, or, a, or a, a list box or a combo box. You style each element using a data template and you arrange the elements using an items panel template and a panel. And here we see two examples with a stack panel 
and with a rep panel. The only thing was really, really different between what we did before and what we did now is that I now suddenly use a scroll viewer around the items control. And that is a little bit interesting. Let's make, let's make an experiment. Please comment out the scroll viewer at the beginning and at the end. And then we are going to test our app. So we run the app and see what's going to happen. We can select, oh, I made something wrong with the sensors and we see that we currently don't have any values. So we have some bugs in it. One bug was uh, by design. I wanted to show you that. And the other bug was a mistake of mine. Uh, we still have 10 minutes to go, so we are fine. But please select more sensors now. You see the sensors, they have not enough space on the screen. I could solve the problem by making the window larger so we will get the sensors on the screen. But imagine your screen is not large enough. Do you recognize that we don't get a scroll bar here? We don't. We cannot scroll down. There is no way of scrolling down. And this is what the scroll viewer adds to our solution. So if I change the scroll viewer and I edit it again, as you can see here, and if I run it, we now, hopefully, if I select many, many, many sensors, I get, you see, a scroll bar. Nice. We get a scroll bar just as expected. So this is why we added the scroll bar. Now let's fix the bugs. My first bug, and I apologize for that, was that I added here a dollar sign. I didn't want to do that. I always mix up the TypeScript syntax and the C-sharp syntax. One time the dollar is at the beginning and one time the dollar is in the middle of the, uh, the string. So please excuse that. That should remove the dollar sign here. If I run it again, yep. Click, 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 click. Now we have meaningful values. The dollar is gone. But still, we don't see any charts. As you can see it here, we don't see any charts. Now, what is the reason? Why can't we see any chart? The reason is that we here have a data context going on. And this is a little bit complicated to understand, but please try to follow along. I know we already work for three hours now or nearly three hours. So um, stay with me. It's, it's important to understand so that you understand that. Let's see. The data context for the entire window was what? It was main window. That's the data context. Why is the data context for everything main window? Because inside the main window.cs, we said data context equal this. This sets the data context for the entire window. Now, the items control binds to the sensor collection. So what is the data context of each and every element in the items control? We have to check that. Let's go into main window. Let's see what the what the um, what this what this sensor selection is. This sensor selection refers to our list box up here. You see element name sensor selection here sensor selection, and it gets the selected items. The selected items come from the item source, and the item source come from the sensors. And if we take a look at the sensors, this will be sensor with values. And this is exactly that data structure up here. So the data context, this one, for each and every n instance of this template is sensor with data. That is the data context. Okay, that's the data context. So within this sensor with data, we can refer to the name we can refer to the temperatures and that's exactly what we want. We can refer to again the name and we can refer to the temperatures. And now comes the trick. We set the data context 
of the temperature chart to the temperature history. So we are redefining the context of our user control. So this user control suddenly has a new, a very new data context. So we do no longer have to additionally go into the data context here, but we can simply write binding because we already are in the temperature history. See that one? That is the probably most complex thing of the whole example understanding the data context. Let's quickly test it and then we will see whether we have to repeat that again. Okay, select some sensors. Woohoo! Our application works. We now get a nice history and we get exactly what I promised you at the beginning. I can change it. I have a scroll bar. I get the history. I can turn on sensors. I can turn off sensors. Exactly what I wanted to have. Let's recap the data binding again, okay? The data context again. What did we say about data context? The data context set the context for data bindings. So this name is looked up in the data context of the element. Data template, what did I tell you? This data template represents a single element in this list here. And what is the type of this list? Sensor with values. What do we have here? A name and the temperature history. So therefore, we can bind to the name and the temperature history. On the top level, the data context is our main window because we set data context equal this main window. Therefore, we can bind to sensors because sensors is again a property inside of our main window. I hope you understand the principle here. The data context sets the context for the binding and the bindings are always relative to the data context. And the complex thing to understand here is that for this chart, we can redefine the data context. We can set the data context to something inside the current data context. So the data context outside here of this temperature chart is sensor with values. So here we are getting something out of this sensors with values binding temperatures and redefine the data context for the temperature charts. So the temperature chart here now has as the data context what? It has this observable collection as the data context. And because of that, we can directly access the data context and we don't need to navigate into a property of the data context. We can use the data context as our very source. And with that, we get a collection of values and then inside the data template, what is the data context inside this data context? A single temperature reading. And what, what is temperature reading? value and is critical. So if we check that one, we see value and uh, up here is critical. I hope you understand this data context stuff and I hope it was possible for you to follow along uh, with uh, the data context here at the main window and so on and so on. Don't worry, for the upcoming exam, you will not have to build something as complex as this data context structure. But still, I thought it, would, it was a good idea to show you a practical example that gives you a glimpse, that gives you a, a, a rough idea of what real-world XAML applications look like. Real-world XAML applications are even more complicated than what you see here. Handling the data context correctly is super, super important. And by the way, this is exactly the same in other UI frameworks like Angular 2. There you also have a kind of data context 
where all the data bindings are relative to. So this thinking in what is my data bound context is something that is the same for all UI frameworks. And with that, if I run it again, it works. It works perfectly fine. We have all our sensors. So we really managed to fulfill our goal. We can scroll. That's exactly what we wanted. Let me take a sip of water and give you a chance to ask questions if you have some. So we have solved the problem. That's good. Uh, and that with that, we are essentially done. So let me show you where you can find the ready-made sample. I already have put it into your Git repository. So this is our course repository. And if you take a look at exercises, in exercises, you will find, where is it? Here, the machine monitor. And this is exactly the sample that I created for this lesson. So if you couldn't fully follow along, you will get the video of this lesson in YouTube as usual. And additionally, for your reference, for your homework, for your exams and so on, you now have this example in your GitHub repository. And whenever you need some code snippets, you can go back here and copy the code from this repository. I hope you liked the example. I hope you learned something new. And with that, I am done with my program. I would like to officially close today's lecture uh, and you will now have two hours of uh, Netzwerk Info Bundesystem in Thank you for participating and I, I wish you a nice day.